that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to give more meaning to my life and be a better person and contribute to society. Um, so hopefully I'll be graduating in the next few months. And going back to what you were saying about caring for people and self-care, um, the realities of the NHS are, I think we all know the struggles of the NHS with you know staff shortages, shortages, um, working long shifts, um, not having any breaks, etc. Um, and although I love caring for children, I was wondering if you had any tips for self-care when you care for people. Yeah, yes, no, even though you have a heavy workload, you know you, you have to sometimes take time off to go to the, to the toilet to go to. The <laughs> so we call that the letting go of them. <laughs> In the US they call it restroom, which I think is absolutely excellent. They call it restroom. So when you really get um, short of energy, that's when you're liable to get really cranky and grumpy to others. Not, you usually maintain kindness towards your patients. They're suffering enough. But sometimes your fellow colleagues, to the administrators and stuff, sometimes you get cranky to them because it's no fault of yours, it's just you're exhausted. So that's why just to be able to go to the toilet and just to say that, you know, well, you know, they ask you why are you so long in the toilet, you say, you know, honestly, I'm constipated. <laughs> <laughs> Up here. <laughs> You're tired, things don't flow anymore. And I tried to teach this in the NH, uh, actually, the, Bit my mistake, you know, the one site I gave a talk in. Uh, it was part of a conference, a uh, human resources HR conference in, in Docklands, in Excel. And they, they flew me all the way from Perth, a nice hotel, just for about an hour's talk. But I obviously made an impression because as soon as I got back to Australia, I got an invitation from the NHS to do the same thing at their annual conference in Birmingham. I had to refuse it though. Because I, I wrote back to them and said, you are the NHS. I've just come back from a long journey. I'm tired, jet lag, and you want me to, to, to hurt my own health by coming back to Birmingham a week later. And you call yourself the National Health Service. <laughs> it's a very unhealthy thing you're asking me to do. <laughs> Try to keep holding this. For one minute, I will start to hurt. Two minutes, I'll be in pain. Three minutes, I'll be in agony. And a very stupid monk. When it gets too heavy to hold comfortably, what should I do? Put it down and rest. You only need to rest for maybe one or two minutes, actually less. And when I pick it up again, it's the same weight, the same burden, the same amount of work because I've rested, it's easier to carry. That is the meaning of stress. It's not how much work we have to do. It's not the burden of our many duties which we have to, to hold throughout the day. It's not knowing or not having the ability to put things down when it gets too heavy to bear. And then resting and picking it up afterwards. And you all find that people say, well I've got no time to take a rest. Absolutely wrong. One of my friends, he a long time ago, and this story I've lost contact with him, he said he always meditate one hour every day except when he was busy. When he was busy he would meditate two hours a day. Because <laughs> he needed that extra efficiency. I think you know this, it's a crazy world. We can have win-win. Instead of working hard, literally until your brain gets so stuffed, you can't produce and perform properly. We could take rest throughout the day. Harvard University picked this up, and they call it an investment of time. It's not wasting time. You take 15 minutes of a break, 
15 minutes you're not working, but you'll find the next two hours you'll get three hours work done. I always say the reason why the British lost their empire, because when they stopped having tea breaks. They used to have tea breaks in the morning, tea breaks in the afternoon, and a lunch hour. That meant they could relax and rest, take a break, and they could address the various problems in the world. When they stopped having tea breaks, when they worked right through, that was the end of their empire. <laughs> well, that's true or not, I think there's to it. Because we worked too hard, and we achieved too little. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Stupid compassion. Yeah, when, when Stupid compassion. Stupid compassion. A good example of that is sometimes people really care for me, but stupidly. So I remember one time I coughed. And as soon as I coughed, I saw a couple of people rushing out the auditorium. And they came back with some medicine for me. And the first person said, oh, this is homeopathy medicine, it's really good for you. It really cured my cough, you must take it. I said, oh, okay. And then somebody else came up to me, and they <coughs> said, this is, let me go again, please don't be the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> they said, this is, I am it, very good for you, cure my cough. They gave it to me, I said, okay, I'll take some. Someone gave some other medication, it's, um, what else have they got, allopathic medication, this is, uh, you know, all the types of medication, I don't know. There's so many people, they came up with a special medication for me. And I, no, they said, you will take it, won't you? And I said, yeah, well, okay. And I had six or seven bottles of cough medicine, <laughs> which I promised I would take. And after I took them all, then I was really sick. <laughs> so try to cure myself. Stupidly, out of compassion, it was making it worse. You know, sometimes, sometimes the greatest act of compassion is let things be. Or well, sometimes I said this at a recent funeral service. The 30-year-old son was found dead in the morning. I said the greatest act of love is to let someone go. Not to hold on to them, to free them and free the grief from your heart. Let them go, let them fly. And you always remember the wonderful times you spent together. <laughs> uh, oh, this is a bit north of here. You know, we camped in town once, I went to a pub. And top of the second floor, there was a band playing. And so my brother and I went to listen to them. There's only six people up there listening to this band. The lead singer was Rod Stewart. I really make uh, poor Ian Chandler, Little Chandler, very, very jealous. When I said I was in the Marquee Club in Wardour Street, Soho, for the first concert of Ben Zeppelin, they were called the New York Mozart. Jimmy Page, I remember him saying that he was just so nervous. And this is his first, first concert. I remember all those concerts. I remember walking out the auditoriums, the clubs, the pubs. And after the concert had ended, never once did I cry at the end of a great performance. So one day, I was getting fed up with this. So one day, a group of monks in Sri Lanka, they had a camera on me. Right down the bar. How are you tonight? And I said, what part of Ajahn Brahm do you mean? Who is Ajahn Brahm? If you can tell who this Ajahn Brahm is, first of all. Because we have something in, in Buddhism, the five components of existence, the five scatters. What is it like? Is it my body and mind? Not my body. Is it my, my uh, feelings? My perceptions? My will? My consciousnesses, which one is enlightened? If you can tell me that, 
they can tell if I'm enlightened or not. Who is this I who's supposed to be enlightened? Or even even a deeper confession. Sometimes when I first tell this confession, people get a bit shocked until I explain it to them. This is deep Buddhism. Because I talk a lot, even write books about the jhanas, these deep blissful meditations, these ecstasy states. They explain the depths. When people ask me, I don't know. I said, well, come on, be honest. Can you enter jhana? <laughs> and I confessed to them, I said, Ajahn Brahm cannot enter jhana. Ajahn Brahm can't do it. <gasps> you hypocrite! You've been leading up the garden path all this time. You, you said that you can't enter jhanas. I said, yes. That's true. Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first. My sense of self, identity, ego, that has to vanish first of all. And then those things happen. So if a person says they are enlightened, that's a giveaway. They're not. <laughs> Being enlightened, is disappearing. Your sense of self identity vanishes. <coughs> and to get into these deep meditations, you can never do it. You have to vanish first of all. Disappear. With all your will, which comes from a sense of being, has to disappear. So you get so still and nothing moves. There's no one left to do the moving. So imagine, what oh, happens to that camera? I'm in big trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine trying to pin a medal on the air. There's nowhere to hook it. That's like trying to hook uh, a label, enlightened or half enlightened. There's nowhere to, to put that label. That's why. A person who says, are you right or not, doesn't really understand what the question is. You disappear. You vanish. Gone. They also, people would ask the same question to the Buddha. They would say that a person who says they're not better than anybody else, they're not worse than anybody else, they're not the same as everybody else. We call those the three conceits, the three judgments, the three measures. Are you better than anybody else? Are you worse? Are you the same? None of them apply. No conceits. No judgments. No feeling better, feeling worse, feeling the same. Oh, that's. Oh, oh yeah, hi. Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> Go My question is, so as far as I understand, growing, developing life is good, but on the other hand, if you think of yourself as already perfect, what is your motivation to grow? Yes, does you grow without any motivation? It's just, does a tree decide it's going to grow? Does a tree decide, hmm? Yeah, today it feels a good day to sort of put forth some flowers. <laughs> it's something which is, is beyond will. No decision. It's the will which is the problem. And you know, sometimes if you stop, like I was saying, stop trying to cure things and improve things, it grows by itself. Much better. An illustration of that is... Because I go travelling around a lot, and remember once I was thinking, I forget what airline it was, you know, looking through the, I don't know if you've ever been on the aircraft, you see these little um, pouches in the front with things to read, I'm getting a bit bored, just uh, looking in the, the in-flight magazine. And there was an article written by a pilot, 
who was a senior pilot of this airline, who was uh, predicting the airlines of the future. He said, in the future, in the cockpit of a modern aircraft, there would only be two beings inside the cockpit. One would be the pilot, and the other one would be a dog. The only job of the pilot would be to feed the dog. The only job of the dog would be to bite the pilot if he touches anything. <laughs> <laughs> so many errors are human errors. If you just let things be automatic, you find that you make less mistakes. Don't interfere so much. Be kind, be care. And a lot of times many diseases, many sort of uh, problems disappear. Often we are the ones who make them worse. I think, if not good, it's not reasonable to keep. And then once you've written it down on toilet paper in dark valley, then you have to do the letting go ceremony. And there's a special temple for that. <laughs> so, so you go in the, the special letting go temple, So, the book I would recommend for you is uh, Garfield, uh, Book of Comics. <laughs> Definitely. Because <laughs> I saw this comic by Garfield about he would say meditation doesn't work for him. So he tried meditation instead. You know, meditation? Tucked up in bed fast asleep. <laughs> he said afterwards he feels so relaxed afterwards and so happy, but also hungry. If you don't like <laughs> Sometimes we read books. Why do we read books for more information? We have an information overload. So the point is that you know, sometimes this monk says something, this expert says something else, this expert says something else. There's so many experts. So, sometimes I recommend a book for so, light relief. Really, there's not enough happiness and joy in this world. So, read a comic book. There's so much wisdom in that. What is that wisdom about uh, uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy? Because this really got me when I first said, wow, this is so deep. That Charlie Brown said, everyone must die one day. Yes. You agree with that? Can you do better? Mm -hmm. Of course you can. 